Well, good morning and welcome to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. I am your host, Frank Akam, and we are broadcasting live from the Hasselson studio here on Marcus Street in Corning. I can't thank you enough for joining us. We've got a busy show. Two guests today. First will be Mackenzie Phipps. She's a musician, up and coming country star. We recorded this quite some time ago, but with all the breaking news that's been going on, we haven't had a, an opportunity to play it. So this morning in the six o'clock hour, we're gonna play that. And then in the seven o'clock hour, we're gonna talk to Ann from Casa Trinity. Uh, that's gonna be a great interview. I know Casa Trinity is always a hit here on the program. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Watch the full two hours, if you will. We have so many comments from over the weekend from viewers. Let's start the program with those. And we're going to talk about Harris's campaign later on. We're going to talk about the polls. Now, many of the media signaling the polls are not looking good for Trump. Now, the Kamala Harris is in the race. They might be a little overhyped, as we've talked about polling in the past. But there are some things to look out for and some things to talk about. We'll talk about that. And Biden unceremoniously being booted from a re-election campaign. Some weighing in on that over the weekend. We'll talk about that as well. But let's get right to viewer comments. First off, hello, Frank. Hello. Just thought about this and didn't want to forget to ask you in the morning. I would like to know how and what your viewers feel about Trump's talk about eliminating tax on tips. Thank you. Okay. So posing a question to all the viewers, what do you think about Trump? And Trump's been uh, talking about this quite uh, extensively. He's been talking about a lot, and that is eliminating tax on tips. I'd love to hear your take. A different comment. From a different viewer, I think our national anthem should be America the Beautiful because our present one surely indicates that we are a hostile nation and it is not a pretty song. America the Beautiful portrays the beauty of our nation, its unlimited resources, and our brother and sisterhood. Unlike the Star Spangled Banner, which essentially conveys a don't mess with us, we'll say, attitude. America the Beautiful is more in line with what our country is and not our attitude. Though we could kick some you know what. If we if they like, but I don't think. But I think they already know that. Well, thank you for those comments. What do you think about that? Switching out the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, to America the Beautiful. Next up, a different comment. Hi Frank, just remembered something about Hillary that you might be able to talk about, provided it would be appropriate for the current topic. Remember, she went behind closed doors along with her cronies, Obama, Pelosi, etc. And how about Pelosi's response to the question of what comprises Obamacare? After Democrats had passed it, she said that we will all know what's in it after we, well, I'm gonna paraphrase it, but she said, we'll find out what's in it after it passes, essentially is what she said at the time. What a jerk, what a jerk they all are. Another comment, this is in today's paper. Too bad most taxpayers won't see it. I hope somehow this can be circulated to area residents whose representation is, I think, stronger if kept local, not the county. Another encroachment to hand over local control and what that viewer is referencing is a public notice in the paper that on August 20th at 7 p.m. the Town of Corning Town Council will hold a public hearing at the beginning of their regularly scheduled monthly Town Council meeting at the Corning Town Hall, 20 South Maple Street in, uh, Maple Street in Corning, excuse me, to discuss utilizing the Steuben County Ethics Board to represent the Town of Corning. The Town Ethics Board will be replaced with county representation. The public is encouraged to attend. So thank you for all those comments after Friday's broadcast. Keep those comments coming in. What do you think of those ideas? Uh, the no tax on tips, your thoughts, and switching out the Star Spangled Banner for America the Beautiful. Have you been watching the Olympics? I have not, but the United States currently leads in total medals at 12. Uh, we have three gold, six silver, <clears throat> and three bronze. And France is at number two with three, uh, three gold and eight total overall medals. Okay, there we go. We got everything covered. Let's start the program with some good news. The second survivor of the Trump rally shooting, James Copenhaver, has been released from the hospital. Now, that's the good news. After all this time, he's been released from the hospital. The uh, troubling news is that he faces a long recovery, according to his family. James Copenhaver, 74 years old, of Moon Township, suffered life-altering injuries after he was struck by errant bullets fired by Thomas Matthew Crooks. He was one of three rally goers shot and the last surviving victim to be released from the hospital. 
The retired grandfather expressed gratitude for the outpouring of support he received while recovering at Allegheny General Hospital in a statement made by the family. Jim would like to especially thank the first responders, medics, and hospital staff who have provided him with initial and continuing care, the family said. Copenhaver has, all, has also kept Trump, whose ear was grazed by a bullet as he stood on stage, and other rally victims in his thoughts and prayers. Quote, he prays for a safe and speedy recovery for them all. His family asked for privacy while he recovers from the horrible, senseless, and unnecessary act of violence. Moon Township Supervisor Al Quayle <laughs> told KDKA that he was in disbelief when he learned Copenhaver had been shot and said he was a regular fixture at local board meetings. Jim's a super nice guy, and I couldn't believe it happened to him. So there is your update. The second survivor of a Trump rally shooting, James Copenhaver, or Copenhaver, excuse me, released from the hospital, though he does face long, a long recovery. New information to come out about the assassination attempt uh, on Donald Trump. The gunman was actually on the authorities' radar for more than 90 minutes before the shooting. Now, we know that uh, Director Cheadle has resigned. Um, many people think she should have been fired, uh, some type of other penalty. But think of the arrogance. She didn't want to go. Her hearing was so disastrous, this information coming out so disastrous to her, the lack of confidence, the lack of belief in the Secret Service uh, finally forced her to resign. Would-be Donald Trump assassin Thomas Matthew Crooks landed on authorities' radar more than 90 minutes before he opened fire at the former president's ca uh, Pennsylvania campaign rally, roughly a half hour more than what officials previously had claimed. According to newly released text messages, yes, we have not been getting straightforward answers. Then they wonder why there's uh, conspiracy theories popping up. Uh, we heard from FBI Director Ray last week who started a conspiracy theory himself by saying, well, maybe it wasn't a bullet that hit Trump's ear. Maybe it was um, some type of shrapnel. Uh, they, they realize the optics of that photo with Trump bleeding and defiantly raising his fist in the air saying fight. So that's why, and we're going to get to it in a little bit, uh, Google censoring that image. Uh, we've heard from uh, those in the media, I think it was Axios that first reported on it, that they're saying don't show that photo. It's propaganda for the Trump campaign. It could, it could actually help Trump. And then you have Ray downplaying that, well, maybe it wasn't a bullet. All in the name of politics. All because of their hatred of Trump. So they do not want to show that photo. But we'll continue. Text messages between members of the Beaver County Emergency Services Unit obtained by the New York Times revealed a more concrete and earlier timeline leading up to the shooting that grazed the former president's ear. Injuring two rally goers and killing one, the messages also revealed that Crooks, 20 years old, was aware of the law enforcement presence as he prepared his assassination attempt. Someone followed our lead and snuck in and parked by our cars, just so you know, a counter sniper texted a colleague. I'm just letting you know because you see me go out with my rifle and put it in my car so he knows you guys are up there sitting to the direct right on a picnic table about 50 yards from the exit, he wrote, of the suspicious person. At around 5, 10 p.m., Crooks was, uh, was below the counter snipers who were inside the AGR International Building Warehouse where the 20-year-old eventually climbed onto the roof and fired his AR-15. One of the counter snipers took photos of him and shared them in a group chat about 5.38 p.m. An officer also wrote in a text that they should tell the Secret Service about the suspicion per suspicious person as a range finder he had on him alarmed authorities. Quote, kid learning around the buildings we are in. AGR, I believe it is. I did see him with a range finder looking towards stage. FYI, if you want to notify SS snipers to look out, I lost sight of him. Call it in the command and have a uniform. Check it out, an officer texted, according to another message provided by the Times by Iowa Senator Chuck Grazley's office. The photos were shared with the Secret Service through a series of steps at the command center, according to the newspaper. So I don't want to read all of this, but this is just another example of why there's been so many questions regarding the Secret Service and why the director should have resigned, should have resigned earlier. I don't know why you would resign when you did um, and not before that hearing, which proved to be so disastrous and really so embarrassing for Secret Service. We've got more on this. Donald Trump weighed in on the female Secret Service agent, who you may recall from that photo. We'll talk about that when we come back. But it's time to take our first break. Stay with us.
This is Frankly Speaking here on WIDC-TV, Big Fox. And we are back with Frankly Speaking, broadcasting live from the Hasselson studio. As I said, we have two interviews on, morning's broadca- on this morning's broadcast. Excuse me. Mackenzie Phipps is going to join us here in just a little bit, and then the 7 o'clock hour, and from Casa Trinity. So make sure that you stay tuned. Donald Trump, we're talking about the assassination attempt. Donald Trump jumped in to defend the female Secret Service agent, saying, I don't know how they didn't get hit, meaning the Secret Service agents. Bullets were flying and the security detail had rushed to shield his body. Every one of them. There wasn't one that was slow. A woman who was on my right, she was shielding me. Beautiful person. She was shielding me. Everything she, everything she could. And she got crushed and she got criticized by the fake news because she wasn't tall enough. Well, you know, she wasn't tall enough because I'm tall and she wasn't tall enough. And she was criticized. She was so brave. She was shielding me with everything. She wanted to take a bullet because the bullets were flying incredible. Now, Trump vowed, as you may recall last week, I had mentioned that the Secret Service had suggested don't hold outdoor rallies anymore, Trump. Um, Even though those are one of the most successful parts of his campaign, uh, there's been a, a, a push for him to end all kind of campaigning, as we've seen from the beginning of this through the lawfare Uh, The judge just didn't have an opportunity (laughs) to actually impose that sentence because of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, But we've seen from the beginning they want to not let him campaign. So the Secret Service, who we've realized seems to be very political, uh, telling him no more outdoor rallies. He's vowed more outdoor rallies in typical Trump fashion. I will continue to do outdoor rallies, and Secret Service has agreed to substantially step up their operation. They are very capable of doing so, he tweeted. Uh, we know that the outdoor rally is very successful. Now the president, former president does a great job at the um, arenas, too, packing in arenas, uh, but there's something about those outdoor rallies. Now there is a bit of controversy, and we're going through a lot of stuff here this morning because we've got so much to get to. Uh, and we only have two hours to do it, and we have two guests. So think about that. You're being quiet. Everybody's being quiet this morning. We had a couple of questions from viewers over the weekend. Um, do you like Trump's no tax on tips idea? That seems to be very popular, um, especially among you know waiters, waitresses, things like that. And another viewer asking or saying that America the Beautiful should be the national anthem instead of the Star Spangled Banner. So weigh in at any time. Now, a key Google feature, continuing with the talks on the attempted assassination of Donald Trump, a key Google feature is failing to show results for the attempted assassination of Donald Trump, drawing claims from the former president's son that big tech, uh, big tech companies, I tongue twisted this morning, it's Monday morning, it's early, big tech companies are trying to influence the election. It has also sparked a Senate investigation. Google users were surprised to discover that the search engine's autocomplete, which I'm sure you're familiar with, was apparently omitting suggested results related to the assassination attempt against Donald Trump. The anomaly quickly, it quickly caught the attention of social media users, including a Texas congressman and Donald Trump Jr., who began sharing screenshots of their own examples showing Google search suggestion coming up empty for queries about the deadly Pennsylvania rally shooting. There's no mention of Trump even when the entire search term, the assassination attempt of, is typed into the Google homepage search bar. The post performed a series of tests, Google searches with the last names of US presidents who were killed or faced attempts on the lives followed by the letters assassin to see what autocomplete suggested, including John F. Kennedy, Abraham Lincoln, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, and Teddy Roosevelt. In each instance, a helpful list of recommended search terms related to the attempts on their lives sprang into view. However, when Trump's name was used, autocomplete offered no suggestions whatsoever. Now, many are saying this is like uh, big tech in the past, uh, censoring information to help Biden and to help Hillary, Uh, specifically with Biden, of course, the laptop story and the like. But a Google spokesperson told the New York Post that there was no manual action taken on these predictions and that system includes protections against autocomplete predictions associated with political violence. One word of the once word of the oddity spread, it caught the attention of thousands of users who were able to recreate the phenomenon on their own, including Texas Governor or Texas GOP representative Chip Roy, who wrote, can verify alongside with a screenshot. Trump Jr. saying, Big Tech is trying to interfere in the election again to help Kamala Harris. 
We all know this is intentional election interference from Google. Truly despicable. Senator Roger Marshall, Republican from Kansas, said, Why is Google suppressing the search about the Trump assassination attempt? These are the screenshots from this morning. Has there been a dramatic increase in uh, Truman biographers in the last two weeks? He asked, referring to the example of searches he included with the post that returned results for him about Harry Truman. I look forward to hearing the response. The Post also performed searches for Biden assassination attempt, both partially and in full, which it should be noted also yielded no autocorrect suggestions. All right. There you go. Just a couple of quick things. Now, we're going to talk a little bit here. Oh, well, we got some comments coming. I'll read them when we come back from break. We do have a, a couple of guests. We've got quite a bit here about the Harris campaign um, raising $200 million since uh, Biden stepped down. A couple things here about Biden. Uh, mostly about the Harris campaign. Ooh, a few New York issues as well that I think you're going to find it interesting. I'm going to try to get to as much of that as possible. Oh, a lot of comments. A lot of comments coming in. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about uh, Schumer. A few things here about Chuck Schumer. And then we're going to get right in to Harris and Trump. So stay with us. This is, frankly speaking, here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. <laughs> And we are back. Frankly speaking, let's take a look at some comments from viewers. Just saying, Harris, what do you think of foreign airplanes over Alaska? We mentioned that story uh, last week. The Russia was flying over in China planes, uh, in Alaska airspace. Oh, China has airplanes. Russia has airplanes. We have airplanes. Airplanes fly. We all have airplanes. Is this a president for the future? Great question. That does sound like a typical speech. Uh, Not sure. This is a different comment from a different viewer. Not sure about the no tax on tips. How would that work with regular wages? Would hourly rate need to go up to minimum wage? The tax system used to allow a lower hourly wage because of tips. Great question. I don't have the answer. If you're just joining us, a viewer asked uh, at some point after Friday's show uh, to ask viewers what they thought of Trump's no tax on tips. Did you see that Chuck Schumer said that he didn't shake Benjamin Netanyahu's hand because they have serious disagreements? They exchange head nods instead of a handshake before the speech. Well, look, you know, I went to the speech because the relationship between Israel and America is ironclad, and I wanted to show that. But at the same time, as everyone knows, I have serious disagreements with the way Benjamin Netanyahu has conducted these policies. As a lifelong supporter of Israel, it has become clear to me, this is what uh, Schumer said back in March, the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then, and the Israeli people are being stifled right now by a governing version that is stuck in the past. Netanyahu said at the time that Schumer's comments were totally inappropriate. Jeffries has been forced to defend Rashida Tlaib's Uh, Silent protest during Netanyahu's speech. Jeffrey saying Rashida Tlaib is an elected member of Congress. She has a responsibility to her district in the same way that I have a responsibility to my district. Uh, I guess that that the responsibility to her district is to hold signs that said stop the genocide, something like that. Again, that equivalence we talked about last week where Alan Dershowitz called out Harris for it, uh, trying to really compare Israel to Hamas. Now, let's talk about the upcoming race. You've got Harris and Trump. I'm confused because I saw a headline this morning. I can't remember where it was from. But the headline was that Trump had a bad week. And I can't figure out why he had a bad week. I guess just because there wasn't quite as much attention on him as the week that there was the assassination attempt. I I don't understand why he had a bad week. But they're starting to show polls to see Harris gaining momentum, that's not a surprise when you see the way the media has been fawning over her since Biden stepped aside. Uh, So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But I thought there was a really good point by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's also technically running for president as well. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was on Fox Business Network's Making Money. And this was on Friday, so it's a little old, but I wanted to pass it along to you in case you missed it. Kennedy said, when I was a kid, the whole kind of central focus of the Democratic Party was making sure that every American could vote for whomever they wanted to vote for. The Democratic Party today is all about the opposite of that, about making sure that candidates who are going to run against their chosen candidate are that the legal system, that law enforcement agencies are used to prevent those candidates from running. They've made it almost impossible for me to get on the ballot in all the states. I am going to. 
In fact, we have now completed all the signatures. I think we have one state left where we have a couple hundred signatures. We've gotten over 2 million signatures, more signatures than any presidential candidate in history. We've done something nobody in history has been able to do up against these headwinds that they've created for us. They're suing us in all the states, but we're going to win the lawsuits. But it's not a good look for the Democratic Party. They're saying, well, we have to do this in order to save democracy from Donald Trump. But they're actually, the real argument is, we're destroying democ democracy in order to save it. I thought that was a very good point. That's something that haven't really even been hiding. I mean, if you look at the lawfare against Trump, trying to keep him off the ballots as well. Um, and how many examples with uh, Biden now proposing changes to the Supreme Court? Every step of the way, it's been an attack on democracy. But uh, again, to paraphrase RFK Jr., destroying democracy in order to protect it. Now, Harris has erased Trump's lead. If you listen to the Wall Street Journal, the two candidates are effectively tied after Biden's exit shakes up the race. The presidential race between Harris and Donald Trump is essentially tied, according to a new Wall Street Journal poll that shows heightened support for her among non-white voters and dramatically increased enthusiasm about the campaign among Democrats. Now, I can understand why you'd have that enthusiasm. There was a lot of a down attitude towards uh, Joe Biden, of course. That's why they pushed him out. So I could see the increased enthusiasm. Does that last? Uh, as the one viewer was kind of joking about her word salad speeches. Now, <laughs> last week we had the story where, wow, she was bad for the last four years, but she's great now. This is what she really needed. She needed to make it her campaign. Well, she already ran a campaign that we recall back in 2020 that was dismal. Um, never making it to Iowa for a single vote. Her only claim to fame in that race for presidency was that she called her now boss a bigot and got a lot of attention for it. But I'll continue with what the Wall Street Journal polling numbers say. The former president leads the current vice president 49% to 47% in a two-person matchup, but that is within the margin of error of plus or minus 3.1 percentage points. Trump held a six-point lead earlier this month over President Biden before he exited the race and backed Harris. On a ballot test that included Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and other independent and third-party candidates, Harris receives 45% and Trump gets 44%. Kennedy is backed by just 4% and 5% remain undecided. Now, Biden had originally trailed in the multi-candidate contest by six points in the last poll. Harris has made strides in reassembling the coalition that put Biden in the White House in 2020, one that has been fraying under the stress of unease about her, his physical and mental sharpness. Black, Latino, and young voters all show greater support for her than they did for Biden in a journal survey taken in the days after his disastrous debate performance on June 27th. Now, again, I say this, and I've said it numerous times on this program, they can use these polls to, again, hurt, uh, hurt or help someone's momentum. So you start seeing the articles, boy, Trump had a bad week. And, oh, Harris erases Trump's lead. So they try to get in the American people's head, thinking it's a lost cause. Um, in a vibe election, it's being called vibe, like your feelings. Battleground poll shifts could or should scare Donald Trump. As 2024 race could be slipping away, says A.G. Gankarski. Donald Trump received a rude awakening Friday night from Fox News when it reported fresh polling in four key states, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, that showed three of them too close to call and the other ones slipping away. It's not ideal for a presidential campaign to peak roughly 100 days before an election, but these surveys especially contrasted with the other polling better for Trump, show the former president's case against Biden doesn't translate to one against Harris as easily as GOP strategists might have hoped. They also show a race arguably slipping away under Trump's nose, especially given a common thread of these polls seems to be a vibe check. In other words, battleground voters like Kamala Harris more than they do Donald Trump right now, and it's unclear how the Republican candidate can change that. As the Fox polls show, no matter who is ahead or behind, Trump is underwater everywhere and Harris isn't. Great for scuba diving, but not great for close elections. Okay, getting a little corny there. Um, is there time to course correct? Po probably. But is there any interest to be determined? So, no surprise there. We're going to start to see the praising, and we've seen that uh, already. We've seen the praising 
of Harris and how things have changed so quickly overnight. Once Biden stepped aside, all of a sudden Harris is a great candidate. We never knew how good she was going to be. They have a new tactic that they're using that you might have heard of. And then coming up in just a little bit, we're going to hear from Mackenzie Phipps. This is an interview that I recorded quite some time ago, but with the breaking news that we've had and the other guests that we had, we have not had time to play it. So I thought maybe starting your Monday with a couple of interviews, Mackenzie Phillips at the 6 o'clock and the 7 o'clock hour, and Domingos from Casa Trinity. So don't miss that. But there's a new, I don't know if you want to call it tactic, I guess, uh, election tactic, campaign tactic uh, that Harris is using, which is Zoom rallies. Now, many of you may have used Zoom during COVID, uh, not ever wanting to go back to those days of Zoom calls uh, with work, but now they're holding rallies for the Harris campaign. The company that exposes the starry, the sorry state of your kitchen is being leveraged by Harris backers to hold virtual rallies that have brought in an influx of energy and cash. Now, we already know that they raised $200 million in one week after Biden dropped out. But these Zoom calls have focused on bringing together identity-based groups across the country. The Zoom call with the group Win With Black Women started the trend last Sunday, drawing over 90,000 participants and raising $1.5 million. A Thursday virtual rally named White Women Answer the Call attracted 200,000 attendees, making it reportedly the largest Zoom meeting in history. And then a White Dudes for Harris call is scheduled for today. Now, unprecedented use of virtual rallies, which costs much less to produce than an, one in real life, can draw far more people. And it's an extension of Harris's campaign's ultra online meme heavy entrance into the race. That's uh, something to keep in mind. Just giving you a little background on both campaigns. We've got a lot more on Harris here when we come back. But first, we're going to hear from Mackenzie Phipps. She's an up-and-coming country star. So that's coming up after this short break. So stay with us. We're just getting started on your Monday morning edition of Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. It's 632, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Aikam. We are broadcasting from the Hesselson Studio, and this is the Stuben Senior Services Fund section of the program. Mackenzie, thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I know you have a very busy schedule, so it is always appreciated. No, no problem at all. Now, I want to hear about the new song, the new single, Pick Your Poison. What goes into picking a single? Uh, well, to be honest, I just kind of write songs and then I just go and record them one by one. And then I just figure out which one I want to put out at what time. Mm-hmm. But Pick Your Poison was one of the first songs that I've actually put out there in the open that I've written myself. A lot of the songs that I've put out on streaming platforms were either pitched to me by my producer at the time, Sal Oliveri, or my backup singer and guitarist, Shane Begley, had written them for me. So I was kind of anxious to see how people would feel about this song because it's my own personal work. And yeah. so far, I've been very much appreciating all the comments. What does it feel like? It's got to be almost very vulnerable to put out a song that you've written for the world to hear, isn't it? Yes, I, I had so many different emotions. You know, I was excited to be putting out my own material and something that I'm very proud of. And then at the same time, I was also just kind of nervous being like, well, I don't know how people are going to take it. Yeah. Cause this song is definitely a little bit more edgier than a lot of the songs I have out today. Okay. So I was like, well, we're going to see what they think. But like I said, I've been getting some great feedback from it. So that's good. <laughs> and if there's one thing, you know, about social media, that's a place to be vulnerable at. Yes. <laughs> there's people and, they will give you the nicest compliments ever. And then there's some people that yeah. will just rake you over the coals. <laughs> That's funny. Now you mentioned this is edgier. How do you feel that you've changed as an artist kind of through the years? Oh, Lord, I got started at a very young age when I was 14. And, you know, when I was 14, I didn't have much stage presence. I didn't have much confidence. Sure. Uh, I got into my first band towards the age of being 16 and I worked with some seasoned musicians and they kind of, helped me learn and become more knowledgeable just about doing music and performing at shows and everything like that. And now being here today, I just take it day by day. I do what I do and this is who I am. And I have become very comfortable in my own skin and just putting out all the music that I enjoy doing different covers of artists I enjoy and just overall being me. And I just love for people to know 
at the end of the day, what you see is what you get with me. Sure. And it's, it's definitely been a journey. I've learned so many different things. I've, I've went up obstacles. You went up the ladder, you went down the ladder, but sure. all in all, you just take it day by day and it's all in the Lord's hands. Well, you mentioned being 14. Is that when you knew you wanted to do this for a living? Yeah, basically. Um, I started doing my own shows out in public when I was 14 years old, and that was basically my job. Yeah. And a lot of people, especially my peers from high school, I don't think necessarily that they understood that that was my job because a lot of people, when you're in high school, they go and get a job at a store or at a restaurant or yeah. anything like that. And I would tell them like, oh, I do shows. That's that's my job. And they're yeah. like, well, how does that make you money and all this stuff? And people just really don't understand that side of music, I think. And especially when I was younger, I really didn't understand it too much, but I enjoyed going out and playing for people. And I really didn't start taking my career serious, seriously until I started getting about 17, 18. Okay. And when you were growing up, obviously you would have been somewhat musically inclined if you started at 14. Who were your influences? Oh, I loved Loretta Lynn. I loved Miranda Lambert, Carrie Underwood, Reba. I loved all of them. I absolutely adored Loretta Lynn. I wish I could have met her. Um, she was actually one of the very first people I ever started singing when I was a little girl. And I'd be in my little trailer park, getting on top of my kitchen counter, singing, you ain't woman enough to take my man. And, you know, when I'm young, I don't, I don't understand what those songs mean. I just liked what I heard. I thought she was a fantastic singer and I was just singing my heart out. And to me, she is the epitome of country music. And she's always somebody that I've looked up to. Yeah. But as far as those other artists I named, I mean, I, I listened to all of them all the time. I even, when I was younger, I listened to the male artists as well. I loved Luke Bryan and Jason Aldean and all of them, uh, George Jones. So I, I have a pretty diverse taste in country music, I feel. <laughs> is there anybody you're listening to now? Ashley McBride. Yeah. I love yeah. Ashley McBride. Um, she is definitely somebody I hope to sing with. I feel like her and I are a lot alike and because she's definitely a person where it's what you see is what you get. Like sure. she doesn't care what anybody thinks. She's been going at it for years and years and years. And now she is finally just, she has taken over the world. And I, I just absolutely love her. So we were mentioning earlier, uh, social media and how social media is a part of what you do. Has that been... Because so you think of the old record days and how different it was. Now social media can kind of take over what a record producer would have decided in the past. So has that really influenced your your career in a way? To a certain extent, it has. It is very difficult in today's society with, with music. I always talk about I was born in the wrong era because yeah. I would have loved nothing more than to have been in the time of Loretta and Elvis and Johnny Cash because you could just go up in a radio station and be like, I'm going to talk to you and you're going to listen and you're going to play my music. Yeah. I would have loved that. I'm such a social butterfly and I will talk to anybody about anything. As far as in today's world, Everything is a lot of times on social media. Everything's on the streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people in the older generation that are in the music industry probably think it's a lot easier in today's time, even though there are pros and cons mm -hmm. to each time period. But I have started to grow my following quite a bit over the last couple of years. Uh, country Rebel, which is the largest country music platform on social media. Those are the individuals that kind of got me my start into opening up my social media pages to all of my friends out there all around the world and without them I would not really have gotten the numbers the way that I did so I very much appreciate them and I just try to promote as much as possible and people out there are finding me so I'm taking it as a win <laughs> that's great we're talking about the new single pick your poison you can find it out now what's the favorite part of your job Definitely getting to meet new people. And also I love to just get people out of their shell because, you know, we do play Shane and I, we play in all different kinds of venues. We play in bars, we play in honky tonks, attentive audiences, festivals, everything like that. And whenever you go and play at those bars and stuff or restaurants, I feel like people, they don't really know how to react with music. Yeah. They're like, do I clap? Do I sit? Do I give them, 
a request, anything like that. And I love to mess with them. Like I'll call on them. I'm like, where are y'all from? What are y'all doing here? <laughs> yeah. What would you like to hear? Give me a rental. I, I love getting to connect with people and we, we have a ball. I love doing my shows. Would you, so would you say out of all the things, obviously the show is more important to you or more fun than playing in a studio? Like you would rather be out on the road than in, in the studio? Yeah, I definitely probably would. I do enjoy going into the studio, but I just love connecting with new people, getting to meet new people. And my music has touched so many individuals in ways that a lot of things could not. I've had people right. reach out to me on my social media talking about, you know, you have just really brought me so much happiness from your music and you've saved me from a dark time. And we just absolutely okay. adore listening to you and everything like that. And it truly means the world to me that my music is able to connect with people in that manner. Is the touring schedule itself difficult? Like the kind of the, the quote unquote life on the road that people talk about? It is. Um, I, I am on the road every weekend, pretty much. I go back to my home state in Virginia, West Virginia, all of them every other weekend. I moved to Nashville, Tennessee last year, back in June. So I've been here now a year and I've just been <laughs> taking it day by day, yeah. but it, it can get stressful. Um, I don't eat as well as I should because <laughs> you're just on the road all the time. Um, my sleep schedule is completely just out the oh, sure. window, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but I, I love what I'm doing. I feel like it's one of those things where if I was not content with what I was doing, I probably would not put myself through all of the trouble <laughs> but i love what i'm doing and i think it's all worth it in the end how's uh, nashville been so far as you're just getting accustomed to it it's been really good you know i was born and raised in a small town in virginia called bluefield and there's not too much going on there it's just one sure. of those towns where everybody knows everybody and we have a walmart we have <laughs> a couple red lights all that but sure. Nashville, there's so much to do here. There's so many places to visit, so many people to meet. That's what I really love and enjoy about being in Tennessee. Well, Mackenzie, thanks for giving us so much time this morning. Where's the best place to find out more and to hear the single Pick Your Poison? Yes, I'm available on all the social media platforms, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. I am really trying to grow those Instagram, TikTok numbers. So if y'all have one of those social medias or both, Yes. Go give me a follow. I very much appreciate it. And all of my music is on all the streaming platforms, Spotify, YouTube, Apple, wherever you listen to music. But if you're looking for more information on me, you can go to my website, which is mckenziephipps.com to learn more. But again, I just very much appreciate you so much for speaking with me today. Oh, of course. Anytime. We'll have to do this again soon. And you have to make a trip out to New York to tour on your next tour. How's that? Yes. Yes, okay. I do. <laughs> all right. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. And we are back. Thank you to Mackenzie Phipps for being our guest. As I mentioned, we recorded that quite some time ago, and there's been so much breaking news. And I don't like to record an interview and not play it, of course, to promote Mackenzie Phipps' music. So I appreciate her being on the show. If you missed it last week, I have posted it on YouTube, our interview with William Lee Golden from the Oak Ridge Boys. I've heard from a lot of you really enjoying that interview. It was a difficult interview in the sense of um, he had just recently lost his son, and recently lost his singing partner, Joe Bonzel, as well, all within, uh, I think, the month of July, he said. So I wasn't sure it was going to happen, but it was, I think, a very interesting interview as the Oak Ridge Boys will be playing the Shimon County Fair on August the 1st. All right, comment from a viewer. She has to use Zoom, and that's in reference to a conversation we were having earlier where Kamala Harris is having, or her campaign, are holding Zoom rallies. Harris has to use Zoom as her in-person rallies only draw reporters and people paid to be there. Never Harris, never another Democrat. Thank you very much for that, viewer. Now, Harris's campaign did raise $200 million, and I mentioned this last week, but there has never been an, an election that has been so influenced by big money. And remember when Democrats talk about big money, getting big money out of politics, uh, no race has been affected uh, to this magnitude by big donors, Perhaps in all of history as really the donors and the money drying up is what one of the reasons uh, caused Biden to walk away from his reelection campaign. But Harris raising $200 million in her first week of White House campaigning. The campaign, which announced its latest fundraising total on Sunday, said the bulk of the donations, 66%, comes from first-time contributors in the 2024 election cycle and were made after Biden announced his exit from the race and endorsing 
Harris. Over 170,000 volunteers have also signed up to help with Harris's campaign with phone banking, canvassing, and other get out the vote initiatives. Election day is just 100, less than 100 days away. This is coming from the Associated Press. So 99 days away. The momentum and energy for Vice President Harris is real, and so are the fundamentals of the race. This election will be very close and decided by a small number of voters in just a few states, said Michael Tyler, the campaign's communication director. Um, uh, but you can already see the media, of course, uh, defending her, propping her up, saying that the momentum is there. A more media-friendly Kamala Harris runs for president. It's a striking turn for a politician who just a few years ago seemed stuck in a perpetual cycle of negative headlines. Her 2020 presidential campaign ended in finger pointing in the New York Times. Her policy portfolio has at times left her with few tangible wins. And in a White House that has prided itself on its lack of leaks, the internal drama in her office has still managed to spill out into public view. You may recall those stories that we had for you that she is not the type of person you would want to work for, we'll put it that way. But since early 2022, the vice president has worked to develop better and more personal relationships with parts of the news media that set the agenda for Washington. Publicly, she's become the more accessible alternative to her stage-managed boss, sitting for on-the-record interviews with numerous outlets. Privately, she's been more willing to mix it up with journalists assigned to cover her. She's invited a parade of prominent television anchors and media executives to dine with her at the Naval Observatory given personal tours of her garden to journalists from diverse backgrounds and shaped trips to do media appear- or, and shaped trips to do media appearances with the outlets serving democratic leaning groups the white house refers to as coalition media which is all of media other than perhaps fox you could argue um, it, it's no surprise i mean the media was going to prop up well they were they continue to prop up biden um, the media knew about his health Harris knew about his health. We had that poll for you last week that showed what was overwhelming, something like 92% or 80%. It was a high number. Don't quote me. I sound like Biden there. Don't quote me. But uh, saying that they believe that Harris was a part of this cover-up, and it is one of the biggest cover-ups in Washington history, keeping Biden in office and, until recently, running for re-election when they knew about his mental decline, when they knew about his health concerns. So now the media is in love. We had Donnie Deutsch from uh, MSNBC saying that he was falling in love with Harris. The the sparkle in her eye. Um, DeSantis says that the media and Democrats are whitewashing Harris's past to help her in presidential race. Democrats and the media are whitewashing things from Harris's past as they scramble to deal with the fallout from Biden's sudden exit. This is coming from Ryan King at the New York Post. DeSantis, who is 45, unsuccessfully ran to be the nominee, underscored that his party is in for a battle against Harris. And yes, I mean, many people have said it, right? Uh, We obviously, if you're a Trump supporter, you wanted to see him run against Biden. It was an easier win. But defeating Harris, no one wanted Harris. So much so that they kept Biden, even with his health issues, in there, not wanting him to go until the poll numbers changed. And that's what it boils down to. It was never about health, never about the security of the country. It was 100% about electability. This is what DeSantis had to say when we come back, because I just realized I'm running late, and I feel as if I knew I was already running late and almost totally forgot. So stay with us. Last break of this hour. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. And we are back. Hour number one, nearly in the books. In the next hour, we're going to be talking with Ann Domingos from Casa Trinity, so don't miss that. A lot of waves coming in, a lot of comments. Here is, did I have a comment? Nope, we're good. We're good on that last break. That was on something unrelated. Okay, this is what Ron DeSantis had to say about the media and Harris's campaign. The media really worked hard to push Biden out. And now what you see is all the arteries of the left, the corporate media, Hollywood, academia. They're using all the king's horses and all the king's men to try to put the Democrat Party back together again. He said this on Sunday Morning Futures on Fox. We have all seen her. I mean, she's incredibly vapid, even more incredibly liberal, and she doesn't have any accomplishments. DeSantis contended that Harris owns the border crisis, inflation crisis, and other failures of the Biden administration. The Florida governor then knocked GovTrack 
for memory holding its analysis that she was the most liberal senator in 2019 and warned that Harris allies are whitewashing things from her past. We're down here in Florida. It's hot in July. It'd be hot in August. But we're going to see a blizzard of lies over the next few months. They're going to try to rewrite history. So be prepared for that. They've already done that, suggesting that all of their reporting was wrong, that she is not the border czar, that, that all of that was just a mistake. She never had control over the border. Yes, they reported her as the border czar, but that was all an error. Now, we're going to talk about, in the next hour, the Harris campaign. Quite a few things here about Biden as well. We've got some New York State issues to, to mention as well. Now, if you're just tuning in at the beginning of the show, I read a comment from a viewer asking, what do you, a viewer of Frankly Speaking, think of Trump's idea of no tax on tipping? Love to hear your opinion on that, your comments on that. Also, we had a comment from a viewer who wants to see America the Beautiful replace the Star Spangled Banner as our national anthem. So feel free to weigh in on any of those topics or anything else that we mentioned. Would you attend a Harris Zoom rally? I could ask that as well. Would you attend a Trump Zoom rally? I never really thought of using Zoom as a rally platform. I guess it's one way. You don't have to leave your house. You can be in your pajamas, as we all were aware of uh, during COVID. Uh, so perhaps there is an opportunity there that Trump can take advantage of. We know uh, originally when, when it was thought that he may go to jail because of the lawfare against him, there was talks of maybe doing Zoom rallies or even in-person rallies with Trump on camera from in prison or house arrest or whatever the case may be. But we have so many comments coming in, which we'll read at the top of the hour. Again, coming up in the next hour, and from Casa Trinity will be our guest. Uh, thank you again to Mackenzie Phipps for joining us on the program this morning. We have a lot of guests coming up this week and next week. Uh, just a very busy time. If you have any suggestions for guests, as I'm just killing a couple seconds here before we wrap up this hour and not wanting to start into a new topic. If you have any suggestions for guests that you'd like to see on the program, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll do my best. I can't guarantee, but I'll do my best to schedule an interview with that person. And as I said, we've got a lot of comments in, coming in, which I will read at the top of the hour, but we do have to take a short break. Then some New York issues, some Biden issues, a lot of talk about the anger that Biden feels, um, the kind of the backstabbing by his fellow Democrats, a party that he's been so loyal to. So he's not happy with the way things have went. We'll talk about that coming up as well. So stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. First hour in the books. Second hour, Frankly Speaking, mere moments away. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome to hour number two of Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Akum. We are broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio here on Marcus Street in Corning. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all the comments that I've been receiving. Here are a few from a viewer. Maybe from seeing such a contrasting candidate from looking at Biden, it's relief for Democrats. I think that's what it is. I think that's why some money's coming in and so much support. It's not about how good the candidate is. It's always been at the end of the day about not being Trump and not voting for Trump. So I think that's the relief factor uh, that, well, thank goodness is no longer Biden because we saw Biden during the debate and uh, other times. But look at the debate when he walked out. It was kind of startling just to see him walking to the podium let alone uh, all the other videos throughout the debate, the split screens, um, him losing his train of thought. So, yes, I think that there is that feeling of relief. Now, will that stay for the next nearly 100 days or not? And that's the next question. Another comment from a viewer. It amazes me how the Democrats scream about Trump and Republicans supposedly destroying democracy while the Democrats push forth a Manchurian candidate who has never won a vote. Isn't that a threat to their perceived democracy? In reality, we have a constitutional republic, and we've seen how they have destroyed dem democracy themselves by interference in foreign elections. The Marxist Democrats are the kings of stealing elections. Um, yes, yeah, she's never won a vote. I mean, she's never received one single vote for the presidency of the United States, a nomination for the presidency of the United States. And yet here she is, with less than 100 days out, being the nominee for the Democratic Party. It seems as if the Democrats would be upset over that, but I, I think it's the point now where they're used to that happening from the Democrat elites taking their vote away and their voice away. So I think they may be used to it. And also, at the end of the day, it's just they don't want Trump. 
So anybody but Trump, meaning literally anybody, uh, whether it's Harris, it could have been any other candidate. Now, will they speed up the process? It sounds like they will, where it could be voted on as early as I believe this week and that virtual roll call to make her the nominee, uh, meaning the delegates, the party elites that got to pick her. Harris's campaign is creating a space for, quote, white dudes to, quote, be honest about their role in history. Kamala Harris is using potential vice presidential candidate P Pete Buttigieg to woo white dude voters who, quote, need to be honest with ourselves and each other about the role we've played in our nation's history, end quote. Buttigieg, transportation secretary and one of Harris's top supporters, will appear virtually at a Zoom event today at 8 o'clock with the group White Dudes for Harris. Quote, as white dudes, we know full well how MAGA cynically preys on resentments. This moment of crisis is challenging us, but we don't let fear define who we are and take us or our country down a dark path. We're coming together to create a space of trust where white dudes can support each other and work to elect Kamala Harris, the next president of the United States. The group sells hats and preaches brotherhood as it looks to create a space of honesty for white dudes. Its key values are this. Quote, as white men, we recognize all too clearly the culture of toxic entitlement surrounding Donald Trump. We need to be honest with ourselves and each other about the role we've played in our nation's history, good and bad. We're creating a space of honesty and trust where we can support each other and work for a new, brighter future. The letter also includes a link to a social media kit with pre-written posts that white dudes can use to try to get others to join the group. Quote, the best friendship I've found with other men are built on mutual respect, trust, and supportive understanding. Would you trust Donald Trump to respect you, to honor your trust, and support you in brotherhood? Now, uh, according to the representatives... There, uh, the Zoom meeting initially called for 10,000 registrations on Monday's virtual event, but after Buttigieg announced he was in, interest apparently exploded. Yesterday afternoon, we emailed 8,000 of you so we could ask you to reach out to your friends and see if we could get a, the little group up to 20,000 before Monday's call, and you guys absolutely crushed it. We're excited to announce that as about 10 minutes ago, we are 20,000 strong. Something unprecedented is happening here, and we are part of it together. All right. Now, according to Rye Texera at the New York Post, and we're going to change off of Harris's uh, campaign a little bit later on, talk a little bit about Trump, a little bit about Biden. Uh, but Rye Texera is um, the liberal patriot, it says here. And Democrats are nothing short of giddy. President Biden, who looked like a sure loser, bowed out of the presidential race and was seamlessly replaced by Kamala Harris through deft and lightning fast intra party maneuvering, the race is reset, all is possible. Who can blame Democrats for being a bit slap happy? They're star staring into the abyss and now they have a reprieve. They have a younger candidate and a more enthusiastic unified party. Those are important and positive differences, but there are also similarities to their previous situation that are highly negative and can't be wished away. For one, working class, non-college voters will likely determine the outcome of the 2024 election. They will be the overwhelming majority of eligible voters, around two-thirds, and even allowing for turnout patterns, only slightly less dominant among actual voters, around three-fifths. Moreover, in all six key swing states, the working class share of the electorate, both as eligible voters and as projected 2024 voters, will be higher than the national average. It follows that significant deterioration in working class support could put Harris in a very deep hole nationally and in key states. Conversely, a burgeoning advantage among working class voters would likely put Donald Trump in a dominant position. This is very important to keep in mind as we are swamped by a tsunami of favorable Harris coverage in legacy and other center left media. Where once her retail political skills were disparaged, we were told that she is now or has always been a con uh, uh, effective, excuse me, charismatic retail politician. Polls, of course, will be scrutinized for signs that the race is shifting to the Democrats' favor, and even small changes will be interpreted as signs that Trump is on the run. But in truth, it will take a few weeks for the race to settle out, and one should be cautious about in interpreting initial results. That said, what we have seen so far does not suggest a fundamentally altered race. Trump was ahead and is still ahead. Democrats still badly trail among working class voters 
and have compressed margins among non-white and young voters relative to 2020. Of course, that may change in coming weeks, but that is where we are now. Looking at the running poll averages, we have the following for Trump-Harris matchups. RCP has Trump over Harris by 1.7 points. New York Times has Trump over Harris by 2 points. And The Hill has Trump by 2 points. Pretty consistent. Another approach is to compare averages of Biden versus Trump and Harris versus Trump. I'm not going to get into all of that. Uh, this is quite a lengthy piece. You can find it for yourself um, at the New York Post. But so far, there's little indication that Harris will do anything of the kind. As Political Playbook noted, three sources in Harris's orbit we spoke to said people expecting Harris to take drastically different positions to distinguish herself from Biden are going to end up disappointed. Thus, instead of a different kind of Democrat, what voters will likely get is a younger, non-white female version of the same kind of Democrat. Put another way, the, Democrat, the Democrats seem content to remain a barren left party and see how things work out. There you are. Okay. That was just a quick update that I thought tied in with all that we were talking about with Harris. we got to take a short break here in just a, well, let's see. I think it's right around 720. We'll be talking to Ann from Casa Trinity. If you have any comments you'd like to get in during the show, please feel free. If you're new to the show, you see the number on the bottom of your screen. You can reach out at any time. There's a couple other things here. A little bit about Harris's running mate. A little bit about Trump, about Biden, about New York. We're going to cover it all. So stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox will be right back. And we are back with Frankly Speaking, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio. I'm your host, Frank Aikum. So glad that you joined us this morning. A couple comments from viewers. Question. If Joe's mental acuity is in question... How was he mentally when he chose Kamala? How about his running of the government? Shouldn't his judgment on all his policies be in question? Yes, and it's something to keep in mind that he is still president of the United States for what, about five, six months, about five months? It's troubling, uh, but that's another part of all of this that the media chooses to ignore and not talk about because they know it reflects so poorly on the situation they put us in. I mean, the media obviously uh, keeping... Joe's mental acuity uh, quiet, not reporting on it. As a matter of fact, if you did talk about it or if you did see a video, uh, they would attack you. They'd say, no, you're, you're wrong. You're just petty. Uh, you're just a Trump supporter. You're just a MAGA um, Trump apologist. Uh, but then, of course, we all saw it with our eyes on the debate stage. Kamala Harris must still hold Biden's border inflation baggage even as Democrats' myth-making machine fires on all cylinders, says Miranda Devine. Kamala Harris is enjoying a honeymoon of sorts. The media handmaidens are giddy with excitement over her TikTok coconut memes. She is girl power personified. The female Obama, a strutting, dancing, exuberant Wonder Woman, gushing on the phone with her besties, Michelle and Barack. This is Miranda Devine. The belated endorsement by the Obamas caught on camera and pumped out on social media in a cringe-inducing campaign video last week was typical of her terminal inauth uh, being inauthentic and social ineptitude. Yeah, the video was awkward. I watched it after Friday's show because we had talked about it in the transcript. It's very awkward that, oh, you just happened to get that on camera, your phone call with Michelle and Barack. Okay, the two Obamas... Hall, uh, uttered 55 words between them and were on the phone for a total of 20 seconds. But Kamala cooed and gushed so effusively you would think she had just won an Oscar. Her over-enthusiastic response looked as if she had been filmed in several takes without the Obamas on the line. It's no wonder she has not done any interviews or unscripted events since being anointed, Joy uh, anointed Joe Biden's heir apparent. Party power brokers still have not spelled out why Joe had to go because if they admit that he's too cognitively impaired to run for re-election, then he has no business being president for another six months. And this is a really good point uh, that Miranda Devine makes that, because uh, who was it that had that piece last week that we mentioned that, well, I didn't like Harris, but now I think she can win. And one of the arguments was that she does need a teleprompter, but she's really good with the speeches she picks from the teleprompter. So you're not going to see, you're going to see her doing interviews with very friendly outlets, but you're not going to see a lot of off the cuff or ad libbed conversations with Kamala Harris. In his graceless, self pitying exit speech, 
Biden never explained why he was dropping out. In fact, he told us his record as president merited a second term. It was party unity that required him to fall on his sword. The party machine has so far papered over the anger of the Bidens, which was evident in the sullen faces of Dr. Jill and Hunter and assorted other family members watching in the, on the Oval Office. Although eulogies are being laid on thick by the usual suspects, and I had a comment from a viewer asking about the outlet that compared him to George Washington. Uh, unfortunately, there's quite a few that have done that. It's unlikely to be enough to solve Joe's ego throughout the lame duck period to come. He and Kamala have an inherent conflict of interest, which will surely erupt in public acrimony. He cares only about his legacy, and she needs to win an election. She will have to throw him under the bus to try to rewrite her own problematic history. The Biden-Harris legacy she has to defend is crippling inflation and 10-plus years, 10 million-plus illegal immigrants, including terrorists and sexual predators. And in her radical leftist past, and it's a recipe for a rout. It was only three months ago that CNN pundits were lamenting swing voter polling that showed she was a drag on Biden re-election re prospects. Yeah, that's what they would say. And now, of course, all has changed. Now she's a great candidate. We didn't know how great a candidate she was. But once the kind of the, the halting part of Biden being a part of Biden's campaign, now that it's just hers to run, she's wonderful and doing great. She's achieved nothing on merit. Every plum job has been handed to her by powerful men. Every woman knows the type and instinctively do, do not trust her. Everything about her drips with insincerity. Whatever, whatever else you say about Donald Trump, Miranda Devine says, what you see is what you get. He is always the same, whether he's on the golf course or behind the resolute desk. He doesn't change his accent or his outfits to pander to different audiences. He is just Trump. But who is Kamala? She was nurtured in the warm bathwater of California progressive politics. She has never built the antenna or built agility or political agility necessary to work both sides of the aisle. Now, I can't go through all of that, but her excruciating we've been to the border interview with Lester Holt was perhaps the her worst part, in a way, of her vice presidency, although it's hard to choose. The attack ads write themselves. She has been enthusiastically in favor of every bad idea the left has dreamed up in the last decade. Open borders, cashless bail, banning fracking, Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, racist identity politics. Her boosters think they will cast her as the prosecutor versus the felon. But as the original Soros prosecutor, she is really anti-law and order candidate. Installed with the help of, her, of Willie Brown as San Francisco's district attorney in 2003 and California Attorney General in 2010, she owns the crime-infested you know what they have become. Uh, but what Dems have is an uncanny ability to paper over the truth because they control the myth-making machinery, the media, Hollywood, and academia. But that leads to arrogant complacency. You become sheltered from reality. You don't see that there are some, just some truths you can't disguise, like the senility of a delusional old man or the, or the kind of word salads that we've seen from Harris, who behaves as if she's auditioning for a reality show called Real Housewives of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So I thought that was a great piece. Now, we didn't read all of it from Miranda Devine, but a little bit of it there. Um, now, if you recall, because uh, the polls show that a large majority, and the number does not stick with me, but I mentioned it on Friday's show, believe that Harris was a part of this cover-up to cover up uh, Biden's mental decline. Of course she was. The whole White House was the media was part of this cover-up. It's one of the biggest cover-ups and scandals in Washington history. Well, Vice President Harris has stated that President Biden is completely fit to finish his term and serve another, despite his debate and interview performances, after having had more than 80 publicly documented encounters over the past year. From July 18th of 2023 to July 17th of 2024, Harris, who is now the presumptive Democrat presidential candidate, now that Biden has dropped out, shared at least 25 meetings, eight lunches, and 46 events with the president. And they spent two times traveling together. That makes Harris one of the people most capable of speaking to the president's mental acuity. Those dozens of meetings are also only the ones listed on public schedules. Not everything the president or vice president does is listed on these, such as time spent in the Situation Room, where Biden and Harris attended briefings together. They likely would have done so after the October 7, 2003 terrorist attack on Israel, for example. After Biden's stumbling and stalled debate performance against Trump, Harris sat down with Anderson Cooper to try to hold the line 
from the commander-in-chief, saying, quote, yes, there was a slow start, but it was a strong finish. And what became very clear through the course of the night is that Joe Biden is fighting on behalf of the American people on substance, on policy, on performance. Joe Biden is extraordinarily strong. I'm not going to spend all night with you talking about the last 90 minutes when I've been watching the last three and a half years of performance. Harris earlier this year decried special counsel Robert Hur's report that Biden was a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory as nothing but gratuitous, inaccurate, and inappropriate. But the July 27th debate publicly put Biden's mental fitness on display, sending vulnerable Democrats in Congress and the donor class into a tailspin. Biden, who had been self-isolating with a reported case of COVID, announced on July 21st via a letter, as you know, that he would no longer seek re-election. Harris, however, spent months before the debate defending Biden's mental health after those series of gaffes and public trips and falls. And I'm not going to go through each quote that she said, but um, the Justice Department, well, we don't want to go into the whole her report, but uh, it was then that Harris described the countless hours she spent with Biden and the secretaries of defense and state and the leaders of the intelligence community after the October 7th attack. The president was in front and on top of it all, Harris told reporters, asking questions and requiring the America's military and intelligence community and diplomatic community would figure out how, no, and figure out to know how many people were dead, how many are Americans, how many hostages, is the situation stable. He was in front of it all, coordinating and directing leaders who are in charge of America's national security, not to mention our allies around the globe for days and up until now, months. All right, we got to take a short break. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox, please stay with us. And we are back with Frankly Speaking. A couple comments from viewers as we broadcast live from the Hesselson studio. If the Democrats want to throw you off the idea that Kamala would eventually be changed out for the puppet the Dems are really going to run, they would have to get all the puppet masters, like the Obamas, to say they were enforcing Kamala. I mean, uh, I think that means endorsing Kamala, wouldn't they? Thanks, Ken. Another comment from a viewer. I agree, different viewer. I agree, no tax on tips. Yes, we had uh, the question posed to us uh, after Friday's show. I'm not sure exactly when it came into the text line there, but asking what you, the viewer, thought about no tax on tips that Trump is pushing. Now, Harris is looking for a running mate. We hear that she has zeroed in on three top contenders. Harris is expected to make a selection by August 7th in order to align with the party's plan to virtually nominate a ticket by that date. Most of Harris's list are white male politicians with centrist leanings who could help Harris appeal to swing state voters as well as business leaders and donors. They have a track record of attacking Trump and his firebrand style politics. You've got Walls has gained momentum with progressives enough to vault himself into consideration according to people familiar with the case. Now, I'm not overly familiar with uh, Minnesota Governor Tim Walls. I know there was some issue with uh, Biden's, even though it was weak, Support, but his support for Israel was looking to cost him Minnesota. So this could be the reason Harris is looking there. Who's on the list? Arizona Senator Mark Kelly. Now it's been reported that that's actually who Obama wanted to run for president and that Joe Biden kind of is a last I'm still in charge kind of move endorsed Harris. And the source said that made Obama very upset, very angry. That's why many speculated that he had not endorsed Harris. He finally did on Friday morning. But that Obama really wanted Arizona Senator Mark Kelly to run for president, but that he is on the short list for VP. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro and Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz are on the short list of the three that are supposedly at the top of the list for the vetting process. Now they go through their texts and their tweets and their history to see exactly what had been said now democrats warn don't take new york for granted it's been less than a week since biden announced he's out of the 2024 presidential race and backed harris to replace him since then the vice president appears to have taken a divided democrat party by storm attracting national and new york support latisha james saying she's in the best position to help or to step into the white house as president of these united states now if you recall Letitia James said she was going to do everything in her power to get Harris elected. Now, that's an interesting statement from someone that's been accused of that lawfare against the former president, uh, President Trump. Um, James organized Black 
attorney generals to back the vice president and jumped on pro-Harris fundraising calls all week. People rally around someone who they feel is like them and who really gets it. And her coming out this song by Beyonce about freedom, that just really changed the game, said Yvette Buckner, president of the Buckner Group, a government relations group. Um, Harris is closing the gap with former President Trump, according to new polling that I just mentioned earlier in the program. But despite the newfound enthusiasm, Queensboro President Donovan Richards, a Democrat, argues the party can't take New York State for granted. National party leaders criticized Governor Hochul for failing to protect Democrat congressional seats during the 2022 midterms. Hakeem Jeffries has ordered a revamp of New York campaigns. New York has always taken the fact that we've been blue for granted. We are not paying as much attention to those new groups and those new trends as we should have. To see Asian Americans for the first time really being one of our core constituencies that we have not invested in in a very strong way. That is something that is now changing. We're focusing in on upstate. We are focusing in on Long Island and what we're not even talking about about parts of New York City for granted, right? This is going to be an all-hands-on-deck effort. Of course, we have swing states we need to win. But just as some people have said, New York State certainly has moved more red currently, and we need to make sure that we're going to do everything to pull out every vote we can. Cordell Clear, a Manhattan Democrat, told New York One that women in the community felt the need to immediately jump out and let everyone know that we support our vice president. We don't want people in the midst of all this going on to become discouraged with the process. The political shift comes as Democrats prepare for their national convention that is less than a month away. Boy, it's a long time in between conventions. Yeah, I, I think that's, what, the 17th or the 19th, something like that. But as it's been mentioned, Harris will most likely get that virtual nomination by the 7th, so a little over a week. Now let's look at Trump. Well, how am I doing on time? Uh, we do have that interview with Ann from Casa Trinity coming up in a little bit during the Stu Senior Services Fund section of our program. Uh, there is, oh, so many comments and waves coming in thank you so much last tango in washington how sad sidelined joe biden may yet have the last laugh far from being a lame duck the president can use his time in office to champion u.s democracy and tackle unfinished business abroad but he's got to be careful too because the things that he pushes you know harris is that one piece said harris is running a campaign as well so she's got to worry about what is done uh, while she is campaigning for those votes. Imagine an old man sitting by himself in a dingy all-night diner in downtown Washington. He has his back to the window, shoulders hunched. Joe, for the old man's name is Joe, looks tired and mournful. Perhaps he's thinking about what was, about what might have been. For him, it's a nightmare. Yet, even if this reality, or if this really were the president, and even if the disgrace Secret Service allowed him so fanciful a private moment, Joe need not feel sad or alone. He has six months left in charge. On paper, he's still the world's most powerful man, and he no longer has to worry about re-election, votes, polls, or TV debates. Who cares now what pundits say? Joe is free in ways he's never been since he was first entering public life more than 50 years ago. Go after the Republicans. Go after Congress. Up to a point, he can do what he likes. Rather than fade into the shadows, Mocked as a lame duck, Biden could get yet or could yet have the final say. Enjoy the last laugh. Take it to the limit. Well, um, the last laugh, many believe, is his endorsement of Kamala Harris. That Obama's and the powers that be did not want it to be Harris. They saw the polls. They saw that she's not a strong candidate. They know uh, how she campaigns, her style. So they did not want her. So Biden, uh, it is speculated, sources say, that on his way out the door, he said, you know what? I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to endorse Harris. And Obama was furious. But I'm not going to go through this whole piece. Uh, but Simon Tinsdale says, six months is not long to change the world. Doubly fortunate is he who gets a second chance. Some valedictorian Biden political home runs could help reduce the mountain of a challenge, domestic and foreign, awaiting President Harris. They could help stymie a returning Trump. Most importantly, perhaps, in dangerous, divided times, Biden can still set the tone. Do we still believe in honesty, decency, respect, freedom, justice, and democracy? He asked as he launched his long goodbye. Does character in public life still matter? The answer is a resounding yes, but amid the clamor, of the advancing electoral storm, it requires repeating at regular intervals by a figure who commands respect. Message to Twilight Joe, brooding in the diner over his cold cup of coffee, it's not quite over yet. America still needs you. 
All right. We've got a few other comments about Biden. We had had a message from a viewer talking about Biden being compared to George Washington. This is a typical refrain now from the media. So you have a media that is propping up the Harris campaign, trying to make her look like uh, she's a good candidate, trying to suggest that this is all she's ever needed to have it be herself and not be uh, under Biden. And boy, she's great. She's going to win. And this is the media. So we're going to talk about that when we come back as well. We've got quite a few comments. But we are going to speak to Anne from Casa Trinity when we return. So stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV. Big Fox will be right back. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Aikum. We are broadcasting from the Hesselson studio, and this is a Stu Ben Senior Services Fund section of our program. And joining us in the studio, and thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. You have a lot to talk about because this is the 50th anniversary celebration of Casa Trinity. How's the planning going? Oh, the planning is great. Yeah. It's great. Yes, we have a lot of a. Uh a lot of different things throughout our region planned for the different counties that we serve. Yeah. So it's been a lot of fun so far. I think it seems like with the press releases I get, you're growing constantly. Yeah, there's a lot of growth. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, but that's wonderful. Yeah, I tell my staff it's like the only trick I have. <laughs> <laughs> How much has it changed since you first got involved in Casa Trinity? So when I came to Casa, I've been at Casa almost nine years now. Okay. And uh, when I came to Casa, they had um, three outpatient clinics. Okay. And so we had a clinic in Geneseo. We had a clinic in Dansville, and we had a clinic in Elmira. Okay. Um, so that was just the three outpatients. And um, we now have a full continuum of services for both prevention, recovery, and treatment services in most of the counties that we're currently in. So yeah. we've now expanded to five different counties, from two to five counties. Mm -hmm. And wow. we have um, added um, a continuum of better programs, so we're able to... Um, create, uh, have services for somebody that needs detox or inpatient services, okay. residential, and then um, supported living. And so we have some housing programs to get people um, from the begin uh, beginning of their journey right. to where they're very stable to re um, go into the community again. Well, what goes into the decision to add new services to CASA? Is it based on need? Yes, it's based on need always. It's based on... Um, you know what the state is is providing as um, initiatives mm -hmm. sure. so that's generally it and when I really look at uh, initiative or an RFP it's really about how is it going to um, integrate our services sure. and I truly believe in whole person care and so that is like mind body and spirit yeah so that's what I look for in the different areas depending on where the need is the most and you mentioned that you're in all in five counties. Do you have to travel all five counties? Um, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And you know, it's it's built, so yeah. you know, over time. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a lot of traveling. Yes. So you mentioned uh, kind of your personal mission uh, when you're doing this. Uh, that's what I think is amazing about Casa Trinity. I know I've talked about this on the program before, but uh, after I do interviews like this, talking about the work that you do, the amazing work that you do, people stop me and thank me for playing the interview because it meant something to them, meaning that there's someone that maybe is struggling that they know. What's that feel like for you for working there for almost nine years? Uh, the stories, uh, the success stories that you've heard. Yeah, it's it's everything. Yeah, it's everything. I could tear up a little bit. I'm sure. It's so important to myself, and it's certainly my life was touched with addiction and mental health issues. Sure. And um, so, you know, I uh, went to college as an adult, and uh, you know, this was the only field, mental health and substance use, mm -hmm. um, that I wanted to be in. And mm -hmm. I became a social worker, you know, licensed therapist, and then have kind of moved through the system in order to make a little bit more change on a macro level. Sure. And um, so it's really meaningful to me and to, you know, think about, you know, how many more individuals are being served um, that really need our care right. and in, in a whole person sent, you know, way, mm -hmm. um, you know, because as I told you, we started out with just outpatient and now we have the whole continuum of care right. um, in some county so yeah. people can get to it. It's just so meaningful. You, you know, people's lives change. Sure. They truly change. And, uh, you know having, uh, you know, different experiences in my own family, you know, watching other people change. Yeah. I mean, that's, people come back to life yeah. and it's wonderful. It makes it all worth it. And that's why this uh, 50th anniversary celebration must mean so much to the staff and the people that are involved with this. So what's the celebration itself going to be like? So the celebration that we're having in each clinic, we're mm -hmm. having something different in yeah. every clinic. 
um, is really the gathering of individuals who um, ha has had impact on our success. And it's also to celebrate the staff who continue to, you know, give the care to individuals. It's um, really also about um, just uh, paying tribute yeah. to where we were and where we've gotten to and um, also bringing light again to the community that there is help, you yeah. know, that, that hope begins with us. And you mentioned the staff. How important is the staff uh, to your amazing organization? Uh, I adore the staff. Yeah. So they're very important. And everybody kind of brings their own um, self to the position. And yeah. it's a nice rounded at each area in each area. It's a nice round, yeah. rounded individuals, you know, or, sorry. It's a nice rounded team. Sure. That brings the care to life for individuals. Yeah. What does the future hold for Casa Trinity? Which I guess is an impossible question to really predict or, <laughs> but, or answer, but what yeah. does the future hold? Because you're busy all the time. We are busy. Yeah. I have really uh, a great team yeah. that believes in my vision and supports it. So that's wonderful. Shout yeah. out to them. Yeah. Because um, you can't do anything alone. Right. And uh, it, it is, uh, we're going to continue to grow. So there are some different programs um, slotted for the next couple of years. We have recently opened up two different mental health clinics, okay. which um, when I started here, we were only a sh substance use disorder mm -hmm. clinics. And we now have uh, two mental health clinics, one in Geneseo and one in Elmira. And we are um, starting to expand that work in different ways. And so our clinics will have mental health and substance use disorder treatment in the same building oh wow. so people don't have to go yeah and it's the integrated care like you don't have to go down the street anymore to get you know mental health clinic if you have an um an, an addiction issue mm. so that means people don't um get lost in the shuffle mm -hmm. which is really important in those beginning days um we're also building right now a um, intensive crisis stabilization center. Okay. We uh, received a grant from Oasis in the Office of Mental Health about a year and a half ago. The unfortunate piece is construction takes so yeah, long. Yeah, of course. Um, but we're in construction now, and so that's happening in Elmira. Okay. And that will be a 24-7 wow. crisis point where people can come. You stay up to 24 hours. You, you can't spend the night. It's not that type of crisis. But we'll have prescribers there. We'll have counselors there. We'll have text there you know the yeah. whole um the whole piece to it and it's like a behavioral health um urgent care yeah you know but there's no medical that happens yeah. there but just for individuals that has any any bit of um crisis yeah you know that they need we can de help detox people and get them to treatment so um so it'll just provide everything for somebody That's who amazing. walks in so we're very excited about that. And proud, Our area sure. really needs it. It's mm -hmm. slated to be able to serve at least nine counties. Wow. So anybody from anywhere really yeah. can come in. That's amazing. And I know I've talked about this with other guests in the past, kind of about the stigma some people have in, in getting the help. So what would you say to a, a viewer that's watching that maybe is thinking about uh, talking to Casa Trinity? Yeah, it's, the stigma is difficult. Yeah. I think that we've done a little bit better at normalizing that this is an illness. Yeah. And it just, you need care. Right. Um, I think the state certainly has some initiatives, and we certainly do that, too. Um, and, you know, they, people who are looking to come in, we have many individuals that work for us that are in recovery. Okay. So they can, wow. they can help you yeah. understand and get comfortable. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's a piece. We have a lot of peers that work for us mm -hmm. that have that lived experience. Yeah. And uh, they get attached to the individuals that come in, and they help them through the process. Oh, oh. And the best place to find out more is the website that we have on the bottom of the screen. Yes. Well, Ann, thanks so much for being on the show this morning, and I hope that you get to enjoy the 50th anniversary celebration. Yeah, we are enjoying it. Oh, Thank you for having me. All right. We'll talk soon. All right. All right. We'll great. be right back. And frankly speaking, stay with us. back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Aiken, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio, and I'd like to thank Ann Domingos from Casa Trinity for being on the program this morning. They do such amazing work, and we're always glad when they can join us on the team. We'll be talking to with Amy from uh, Casa Trinity. 
I believe, next week about other events they have coming up. It's a busy time for Casa Trinity. A couple comments from viewers. Amazing that you got to interview Mackenzie Phipps. Now, that if you're just joining us, you missed that interview in the 6 o'clock hour. I interviewed, geez, it must have been about two weeks ago we recorded the interview, no, three, and then all the breaking news happened. I never could find a pro, an appropriate spot to play, so I thought this morning, just to change things up on the Monday morning edition, we'd play that interview with Mackenzie Phipps. Amazing that you got to interview Mackenzie Phipps. Just listen to her singing. She is definitely going places. She has a beautiful presence and a unique singing talent. Yeah, she's very nice to talk to as well. I thought that was a good interview, and I appreciate her being on the show. There is a group... Uh, where I get some of these interviews from uh, country musicians. And that was one on um, the docket. And I said, I'll take it. Next comment from a viewer. Every time I hear them talking about Kamala debating, I think of the interview she had after she was named as Biden's VP. I think it was Charlemagne. Yeah, he's, he makes a lot of news. He asked her how she could serve with someone that, said, that she said was a racist during the debate. Her response was, it was a debate. The only takeaway you can have from that statement is that she lies during the baits. I, I know, Ken, and they don't even hide it. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess that's a, a fair excuse. Oh, it was a debate. Um, another comment from a viewer. In my opinion, our national anthem is our national anthem. Leave it be. And that's in reference to a viewer uh, this morning. Well, it was actually, I had a couple comments from after Friday's show, and I don't know what time they came in. The one asked what you, the viewers, think about uh, no taxes, on tips that Trump is proposing. What's your thoughts on that? And also a different viewer asked or kind of stated that they believe the national anthem should be not the Star Spangled Banner, but should be God Bless America. So your thoughts on that. Now, Biden is going to push for a constitutional amendment next week to reverse the Trump immunity decision and reversal from the president's longstanding resistance to changes to the high court. Biden said on Wednesday that Supreme Court reforms would be among his top priorities for the, his remainder in office. Biden announced Sunday that he would not seek re-election. You know that. The president is expected to propose setting term limits for justices on the Supreme Court, which would require a constitutional amendment and establishing an enforceable code of ethics, which would be enacted by Congress. This is coming from Politico. Biden is also likely to voice support for a constitutional amendment that would limit immunity for presidents and certain other office holders after the court ruled in July that presidents cannot be prosecuted for official acts during their time in office. The court's ruling stemmed from a case concerning former President Trump. Now, a, co a viewer had commented about this. Biden is being compared to George Washington by liberal commentators in a rush to support him after his withdrawal. Biden faced increasing pressure from the members of the media to step aside as the nominee. The president's announcement on Sunday that he would drop out of the race ended weeks of debate within the Democrat Party. Political commentators and liberal media talking heads called Biden a hero for choosing to withdraw from his campaign, with multiple broadcasters comparing Biden to founding father and first president of the United States, George Washington. So very, it was very much the people that stabbed him in the back to get him out and tell him not to run are the same people now praising him, calling him George Washington. If you cannot appreciate the dignity, the grace, the selflessness, the patriotism of that speech, akin to Washington's farewell, but instead feel compelled to denigrate him, nitpick, or return to petty partisan politics, I pity you, says Washington Post columnist Jen Rubin. You're denying yourself the majesty, the inspiration of America and of a great president. Go self-reflect. Robert Costa said a powerful photo, the hand toward his father's face, the eyes, put aside politics and everything related for a moment, and viewed simply on a human level, you see two men, father and son, still at each other's side, more than half a century since the darkness of December 18, 1972. MSNBC's Joy Reid said Wednesday that Biden showed the country the extent to which he would sacrifice his own personal ambitions. This was selfless on a level, I think, that's important in a way that we talk about George Washington being selfless. In saying, I could keep doing this for me, because I think I can, but I'm going to stop doing it because I think there are choices. Joe Scarborough saying, his decision is one of the most remarkable acts of leadership in our history. An act of self-sacrifice that places him in the company of George Washington, who also stepped away from the presidency. Uh -huh. Oh, by the way, uh, that, that quote was that Joe Scarborough read was from 
a historian, John Meacham. Now, if you remember, John Meacham was fired by MSNBC uh, as a contributor in 2020 for failing to disclose that he served as a speechwriter for Biden <laughs> during the campaign. CNN host, I can c- continue here. You can tell when a media, when the media talking heads get their talking points. Abby Phipps said that, or Philip, excuse me, said that the president would be a much more powerful na- national figure if he continued to lean into the decision he made by dropping out of the presidential campaign. This moment puts Biden, you know, with a bunch of American greats. You know, the sort of George Washingtons of the world. What a way to say that, the George Washingtons of the world. Okay. He's stepping away from power. If he stays in that lane, I think that will be so much powerful, that, that it will be so much powerful and impactful. I wonder if that's just a typo there. Presidents are merely custodians of the White House, said Elisa Farrah Griffin on The View. They're there as elected representatives of the people, not to be there forever, not running because the country is all based around them and their vision. They're there to serve for a period. George Washington knew when to pass the baton. I said a year ago on this show, if Biden did pass the baton to the next generation of leadership, the history books would remember him very fondly, and I believe that deeply. So little did you know, we have George Washington incarnate and Joe Biden. We got to take a short break. Stay with us. Last break of this morning's show as we wrap up the Monday morning edition of Frankly Speaking. Don't go anywhere. And we are back, frankly speaking, broadcasting live from the Hesselson Studio here on Market Street and Courting. Just a few things to get to quickly as we wrap up today's edition. Uh, Governor Wes Moore from Maryland, believes that Biden deserved better than people publicly demanding he step down. I also know that the president deserved better than people who are running around him and going into public and demanding that the president of the United States step down, particularly when you look at the track record of the Biden-Harris administration. I've had a phenomenal partner in the Biden-Harris administration to be able to deliver the kind of results that we needed in Maryland. And so I knew that if he said that he was going to continue pushing forward, that I was going to stand with him. Chuck Schumer dared Trump to dump J.D. Vance, I don't know if you've heard this, but the new talking point from the left, from the Democrats, is that he's weird. That's the word they're using. Donald Trump, I know him, and he's probably sitting and watching the TV, and every day it comes out that Vance has done something more extreme, more weird, more erratic. Vance seems to be more erratic and more extreme than President Trump, and I'll bet President Trump is sitting there scratching his head and wondering, why did I pick this guy? The choice may be one of the best things he ever did for Democrats. And that was such the talk about Trump back in 2016. Best thing that ever happened to Hillary Clinton was Donald Trump getting the nomination. Do you remember that? Now the president has about 10 days before the Iowa, Ohio ballot is locked in, and he has a choice. Does he keep Vance on the ticket where he already has a whole lot of baggage? He's probably going to be more baggage over the weeks because we'll hear more things about him. Or does he pick someone new? He has a choice. Maureen Dowd says, J.D. Vance, perfectly dreadful. Uh, isn't it nice? The f- fair media. The Business Council of New York, I want to mention this if you get a chance. The business, the business Council of New York State announces voting is now open for the inaugural Coolest Things Made in New York contest. You can go to madeinny.org, madeinny.org, and vote in the bracket style head to head competition of the coolest things. Made in New York. Again, madeinny.org. And here in the Southern Tier, Kathy Hochul, Governor Hochul, has announced $18.2 million is going to the Southern Tier Network to build out 223 miles, own and operate, open access fiber to the home networks, connecting over 4,200 homes and businesses in eight towns across Steuben, Schuyler, Chemung, Tioga, and Tompkins counties. There you go. We're out of time for today's edition of Frankly Speaking. Do I have time for these last few comments. The only thing that Biden and George Washington have in common is they both crossed the Delaware River. (laughs) That's a good one. Uh, Another comment from a viewer. You said it right when you said that the two-hour show goes by quickly. Fastest two hours on TV. I would agree. Boy, it sure seems, especially when we have two guests. And I want to thank those two guests. Mackenzie Phipps, find out more about her music. You can search for it. I know we already have some new fans because she did such a good job on that interview. And I really did appreciate hearing from her. And also, Anne Domingos from Casa Trinity telling us about their birthday celebration, anniversary celebration. So thank you to Anne from Casa Trinity for being our guest. Yes, I don't know where the time flies. There's so much to cover. I was thinking this is the first Monday we've had in a while where there wasn't, what, about five breaking news stories to kick off with. Just kind of falling back into the 
the reporting and coverage of everything you need to know as we near the presidential election. Um, again, posing these questions on our way out the door. What do you think about Trump talking about eliminating tax on tips? I'd love to hear from you uh, over the course of the day. And do you think that America the Beautiful should be the national anthem and not the Star Spangled Banner? Well, have a great day, everyone. And join us tomorrow morning starting at 6 a.m. for Frankly Speaking, only on WYDC-TV Big Fox. We will see you tomorrow morning, bright and early. I look forward to it already. Have a great day, everyone.